Valerie Fraser. I'm a neurodevelopmental optometrist and owner of New Horizons Vision Therapy Center. Today we're going to be talking about advances in amblyopia treatment and we're going to talk about um, kind of how the traditional treatment of amblyopia has often gone and some new things that have come out that um, may be more effective than the traditional treatments especially for patients who are older or didn't respond to the traditional treatments. I think it helps to first talk a little bit about what amblyopia is. Um, sometimes um, the layman's term, often called lazy eye, um, is used. Uh, but it's basically when the vision of one eye is reduced because it fails to work properly with the other eye inside the brain. So the eye itself may look normal, but for various reasons, the, the brain tends to favor one eye over the other. Um, oftentimes, doctors grade amblyopia based on the level of visual acuity in, in the eye. Uh, for instance, um, might be 2040 or 2400, um, with normal vision being typically around 2020. So what do those numbers mean? Well, 2020 usually refers to um, the ability to see a certain size letter at a certain size distance. So the first 20 is references the point of how far away you are, or 20 feet, and the second 20 references the size of the letter. So a 2400 amblyope would maybe only be able to see the big E on the eye chart. Um, and to put it in perspective, um, people who um, C2040 usually can drive without glasses or legal to drive without glasses. Um, and then the smaller letters would be the 2020 line, and that's typically what we consider normal vision. Um, in other words, that's what most people can see at 20 feet away. So amblyopia is usually diagnosed when there's a difference uh, in visual acuity between the two eyes, um, even with their glasses prescription on. Um, and there's usually no underlying physical cause for that difference. So in other words, structurally, the eye is healthy. So what does cause uh, amblyopia? The main um, word to remember there is suppression. And what suppression is is when the um, information from one eye is basically ignored by the brain. This usually occurs because the brain is receiving two um, conflicting images or unequal pictures and is having trouble putting the images together. So the two main types of amblyopia tend to be strabismic amblyopia, where an eye actually turns in or out, and therefore the, there's two images that aren't lining up with each other, so the double vision can be confusing for the brain, so rather than see double, it tends to ignore or shut off the eye that turns most often. So usually when you have strabismic amblyopia, um, the eyes are not alternating, which is looking. It's usually always the same eye that's turning. And again, over time, the brain um, will start to ignore that other picture, that second picture. Um, in refractive amblyopia, uh, what happens is that basically one eye has a clear, clear image and one eye has a blurry image because there's a difference in the prescription between the two eyes. So again, the brain will have trouble putting those two images together, the blurry one with the clear one, and will choose to um, only see or only pay attention to the clear image. And over time, even with glasses on that eye, no longer can see um, Chris, the, the amblyopic eye. So I know the layman's term often for amblyopia is lazy eye, but when we think about it, um, you know, it's not really the eye itself that's lazy. Uh, binocular vision really occurs in the brain. So what we're talking about is an inability for the brain to put the two images together. And that's the crux of the problem. Um, interestingly enough, the amblyopic eye is usually only partially ignored or suppressed. Um, so the peripheral part of the vision might actually um, work well with the other eye and maybe the, they actually work together in the peripheral vision, um, but maybe when you get to that smaller or detailed stuff of the central vision, the eye starts to, to be ignored. Um, it's often easier to think about it rather than being lazy is that really the, 
the non-amblyopic good eye is actually kind of acting a little bit like a bully um, and um, because it's kind of overtaking the weaker image. So why does it matter? Well, um, one of the things that uh, happens when we use both eyes together is that we actually have um, depth perception or three-dimensional vision. And that's really important um, for just being aware of the space around us and especially for the peripheral awareness on the side of that um, is amblyopic, it tends to be worse than the, the other side. So just being aware of that space on that side of the amblyopia um, may be reduced, um, especially in severe cases. Um, the other important thing that uh, using both eyes together gives us is uh, the ability to judge distances. So we especially think about that when we're driving, um, uh, but also for sports performance. So being able to catch a ball or being able to um, follow and is something that helps um, give you better depth perception. Why does it matter? Um, well, the other reason why it matters is that um, amblyopia also has a negative effect on reading fluency and speed, and also with gross and fine motor development. So there was a study that showed that even with treatment, um, and maybe even getting to the point where both eyes have equal visual acuity, the amblyopia can still cause difficulty with um, reading speed and fluency with both eyes open. Um, so their eye movements tend to be less accurate and they're also, uh, their reading tends to be a lot slower. And then there was other studies that show that you de that amblyopia itself can also um, have a negative effect on the fine motor and gross motor development. So let's get to the treatment aspect of amblyopia. So commonly um, amblyopia is gonna be treated um, in different ways depending on what type of amblyopia that they have. So it makes sense that if you have a refract, what we call the refractive amblyopia or two prescriptions that are different in each eye, that glasses are gonna be part of the treatment. Um, um, and for other patients, um, one of the new newer treatments that's come out in the last few years is atropine, atropine drops um, that has some pluses and minuses. And then the very traditional method of um, uh, treating amblyopia has been patching. So we can talk a little bit about um, the pros and cons or, or some different aspects of those three uh, methods. So uh, prescribing glasses for refractive amblyopia is, is definitely going to be necessary um, in order to get both eyes working together. The problem is not necessarily uh, that we don't want to prescribe the lens for, for that amblyopic eye, but has to do more with what happens um, with when they make the glasses themselves. So in the traditional lens manufacturing, what you'll end up with when there is a difference, a big enough difference between the two, two eyes in the prescription is that you'll end up with unequal image sizes. So if you think about it, so if you have a one lens that magnifies and one that maybe has a normal size image, um, you're gonna have, still have trouble making sense of how to put those two images together because they're not equal image sizes. Another thing that happens is that when you look at different parts in the lens, say up or down, right or left, that there is a prismatic effect that occurs. And what that means is that the image in one eye is shifted over in comparison to the other eye. So you can kind of see that on the picture on the right where the two images still don't line up very well because um, of this prismatic effect. Now, one of the things that we're using in our office to um, provide a solution to that is the use of a Shaw lens. So uh, Shaw lenses are basically manufactured to make the image sizes equal while still um, correcting the nearsighted or farsightedness or astigmatism that's necessary in, in the eye. Um, the other option, um, which for older adults uh, might be a, a, a good option, is a contact lens. Um, but contact lenses don't always work for, for everyone. And of course, younger children can have 
different applications, such as getting them in and is that as well. Um, we've been using the Shaw lens for over a year now and have seen good results. Um, some of their studies show at least two lines of improvement just by switching over to this um, Shaw lens versus um, just wearing a normal glasses prescription. Another atropine blots, blots oh, drops. <laughs> um, so what those are, are they're drops that basically um, dilate the eyes. And you usually put it in the, the dilation drop in the, the eye that is the non-ambient eye, or quote unquote, the good eye. Um, that um, basically what it does is it tends to wipe out the focusing system in the eye. So it's when you dilate the eyes, oftentimes that focusing system will relax. So they won't be able to focus up close with the, the good eye. And so it's gonna force them to use more of the bad eye. So the pros to that is that both eyes are still seen. So you still have um, binocular vision or being, you're still using both eyes at the same time, at least at distance. The cons are that um, that eye is going to have a lot more, uh, be a lot more light sensitive because the eye is going to be dilated. Um, you're also going to have reduced near vision in that eye. So you really have to think about um, how is the child using their eyes? Um, how is it going to impact schoolwork and learning? If you're an older patient, it may not be a good option because, of course, you know you probably do have to work and, and work at near. So the reduced, um, uh, near vision is a big factor to consider um, in how it's going to affect the overall child's development in other areas. Um, and then there is a, a um, risk of possible doing long-term damage to the, to the, the quote-unquote good eye or non ambulatory eye ability to focus, depending on how long the atropine is used. And while rare, uh, there is a concern that um, this is basically the same kind of class of family of like Xylodonna, or there could possibly be some cardiovascular side effects. And it is one thing that you for certain do not want to get in the hands of a small child or ingest um, because that could be um, very toxic. So if you are using atropine, make sure to keep it locked up so that um, young children couldn't get to it. Getting back to the atropine and understanding the the impact on um, learning. Um, this is kind of just a demonstration of how it can look like when your, your eyes aren't focusing well or not quite able to use them the way that they should. So again, if you're blurring out the good, quote unquote, good eye, um, then the amblyopic eye has to do all the work. And if you can't see to learn, you're going to see um, some difficulties in school arise not because of intellectual reasons, but just because their visual system's not working as well as it should. Um, so patching. So patching has probably been around for the longest amount of time and has been um, one of the staples um, for treating amblyopia for a long time. Um, the idea behind patching is that if you cover up again, the good eye, that the weak eye will get stronger um, over time. And the problem with that is that, well, one, first of all, compliance can be difficult. Um, and for the same reason, the atropine may not be a great um, solution uh, for school-aged children. Um, it's the same reason why patching could also maybe not be um, the best uh, a solution for, for kids in school. The other problem with atropine is it's very long lasting. So, so it's not something that you can just um, um, do short term. Uh, although there are some protocols where people um, will use atropine just over the weekend. Um, the other problem with patching is that you're really just eliminating the use of uh, both eyes. So it's going to maybe have a negative effect with depth reception, especially when you're wearing the patch, you can have depth, good depth reception um, or stereopsis when you're um, not using both eyes. 
<clears throat> and then another negative side effect is that they're unable to use their peripheral vision when using a patch. So the one side of their vision is going to basically not be there. And if you think that that to understand how that might have an effect on gross and fine motor development, um, try putting a patch on yourself and see how long that you can go um, before starting to have problems. See what it does when you're trying to maybe navigate it even through a doorway and how it might affect your abilities um, with just activities of, of daily living. Um, so, the other problem with uh, just straight patching is that even if you're, even if the visual acuity does improve, it doesn't address maybe all the areas that this, the eye still may not work as well in. For instance, accommodation, or basically that's their ability to focus their eye at near, may still be poor in the amblyopic eye. Um, it's not working directly on tracking and eye movements. They still may have difficulty when the contrast is low or in dim lighting. Um, they may still have uh, trouble with their visual motor coordination in that eye um, and visual information processing. The other problem, so with, with patching, a lot of times I will use a patch, but we'll do what may be more effective is if we do some actual visual skills activities while doing the patch. So rather than just patching for the sake of patching, or what I call passive patching, a lot of times I will give my patients um, specific visual activities to do while wearing the patch that will work on the areas that I just talked about directly. This tends to be more effective and helps us uh, spend less time with the patch, which I think is important um, um, for developing both eyes together. And so again, you know, patching alone doesn't promote that two-eyed or binocular vision that we're looking for. So um, if you're not working directly on getting both eyes to work together, you'll often still lack uh, depth reception even after treatment, even if uh, both eyes can see 20-20, it doesn't mean that they're actually working together. Um, sometimes when you unpatch, the information from the amblyopic eye is still being suppressed or ignored. And um, the problem with patching sometimes also has to do with how long doctors will prescribe patching for. Um, I've seen pa patching done 24 hours a day with um, very little progress. Um, and the research shows that longer periods of patching are really not that much effective than doing shorter periods of patching. So if you are going to patch, I recommend you know, you really don't need to do it for long periods of time, usually a couple hour days, a couple hours of a day are enough. Um, and that's important because, um, again, we don't want to do anything that's going to interfere with the overall child development. All right, so what other things can we do or what is, would be a different approach to treating um, amblyopia. So let's just start with the strabismic amblyopia, which is basically when one eye turns in. So in the type of um, optometric vision therapy that, that we do, um, we will prescribe, I will prescribe glasses or sometimes even a bifocal if it's indicated or will help the eye turn. Um, a lot of times though, the beginning of therapy, we're really focused on improving eye movement skills, especially in the skills that um, in the eye that turns, a lot of times working on some range of motion things as well. Um, and then the goal really in strabismic amblyopia should actually be uh, improving alignment of the eyes. Um, without good alignment, that's going to be it's going to be difficult to overcome the amblyopia. I have seen some cases where, in fact, increased patching actually makes the alignment issue worse because they aren't using their two eyes together at all or don't have the opportunity to use their eyes together at all. Um, so again, in this, this type of patient, I'm probably going to limit how much patching we're going to do um, and keep it to just working on certain visual skills with that eye. Um, so part of improving alignment is also enhancing depth perception and the ability to see in three dimensions. And 
um, with that, once they start getting better alignment, then we can start to advantage the uh, ambiotic eye so that um, um, we're not necessarily totally blocking out the eye, but we're um, advantaging the ambiotic eye and disadvantaging the non ambiotic eye. Um, we call it the push pull method. Um, and I'll go over an example of that in a few minutes. And then we usually will start where they can uh, achieve success and then increase the challenge as the vision improves. So usually that means starting close and moving to um, farther distances. A lot of um, patients can find a place where usually up close where they can align their eyes and maybe use that peripheral vision in each eye and, and make the two images fuse together um, in their periphery. So if we can get that to happen and then we can just expand that out to um, outwards to where they are having more difficulty. Um, so um, our approach for um, refractive amblyopia is going to be um, to first prescribe a lens that enhances binocular vision. So that might be um, the use of a Shaw lens. Um, improve eye movement skills, especially in the amblyopic eye. So we're also going to Again, do that uh, method where we're going to not completely block out the good eye, but advantage the um, amblyopic eye while disadvantaging the non-amblyopic eye so that um, we're working at it from both ends, but maybe have using still using both eyes together at the same time. And then depth reception is, of course, important in uh, refractive amblyopia as well. And then we're also going to, um, again, start where they can get it and then and then move outward. So again, usually that means starting up close and then working farther away. Uh, so who provides this kind of treatment? Um, well, like I said, we do kind of do use these methods in our office. Um, generally, um, doctors who provide optometric vision therapy um, are, it's going to be a kind of specialty area, so they have more education in the treatment of amblyopia or or other um, eye problems that affect how the eyes work together. Um, one of the things that you can look for is uh, you can look on the um, COVD website, College of Optometrists and Vision Development. They do have a locate a doctor um, uh, program that can help you find someone in your area if you're. We're located in the um, Madison, Wisconsin area and uh, the Delafield, uh, Wisconsin area. And then I would say one of the things to look for too is um, board certification in the area. So I've uh, got my board certification um, in the area of vision development and vision therapy. So what kind of things do we do in optometric vision therapy to work on these um, binocular procedures? So a lot of times we're using lenses um, to uh, get a patient to use their eye in a different way or to overcome an obstacle. Uh, for instance, in the picture all the way left, we're using lenses that actually separate the two images out so they can be aware of both images at the same time. Um, so we use that one a lot in refractive amblyopia. Um, we do a lot with depth perception pictures and 3D pictures. So in the middle picture um, um, is an example of how we use um, depth perception. He's pointing to where he sees the 3D picture out in space. Um, and then we also use um, that in that push-pull method that I was talking about before, we also use um, red and green glasses and activities. Um, one thing that many people don't realize is that red and green tend to cancel each other out. So if you look at the the um, far right picture, you can see through the green lens um, to see the picture below. Um, so that usually would put it over in front of the amblyopic eye and then the red lens gets blocked. So it's kind of like a patch, but, um, but since both eyes see the rest of the picture, um, we're just working on that very central part of the suppression. Um, and it's allowing them to use, still use both eyes together, but we're just advantaging, again, the, the amblyopic eye. Um, one of the exciting new um, pieces of, a, of a therapy equipment that we added recently was the Vivid Vision um, system. 
what the Vivid Vision system is, is it's basically a virtual reality game made for um, vision therapy and purposes and especially treating amblyopia and strabismus. Um, what's great about it is that it allows us to modify many variables to allow both eyes to, again, continue to be seen. But for instance, like on the left-hand picture, one eye sees the basket, the other eye is seeing the basketball. And in order to be successful in the game, they have to learn how to coordinate those images together. But the rest of the background is all the same. So um, they're still working in a um, three-dimensional or um, IT environment um, in their peripheral vision, and we're just specifically focusing in on the central vision to get them to use the ambiopic guide. Um, there's other features that we can vary. So if we need to blur the, the image in the, in the quote unquote good eye, we can do that. Um, um, there's also games that work directly on depth perception. Um, so on the picture on the right, the little boy is poking to where the, the um, uh, a bubble looks like it is in space. So it also involves some use of hands and and using working on depth perception at the same time. So uh, it's been a great program for us um, so far, and we're really excited about it. And uh, we're only the second doctor in the state to to provide this um, new form of treatment for amblyopia and strabismus. Um, one of the nice things about it as well is that it's been working really well for patients who are maybe a little bit older or have been told that they, you know, there's nothing that can be done um, to treat their amblyopia strabismus. Um, so that gets us to the question, so at what age can amblyopia be treated? And, uh, you know, the old way of thinking was that amblyopia couldn't be treated after the age of eight. Um, they, they thought there was this critical period where the brain was no longer what we call plastic or couldn't learn these skills. Uh, the new re research and my clinical experience shows that it's absolutely false. Um, I work with many patients um, that are older adults, um, well, into adulthood, like they're in their 50s, but have gained depth perception. Um, again, using some of these newer techniques that I was talking about uh, to work on the amblyopia and strabismus in a different way. Um, and some of the research that's coming out is also supporting that, 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 that actually you shouldn't uh, cut off as far as uh, treatment age goes, and that um, using this binocular vision, or they sometimes call it perceptual learning approach, the amblyopia can be treated in um, older patients. That being said, I think it's important to uh, note that earlier treatment is always uh, better, so you don't want to um, um, wait to, to treat. Um, it is important that uh, we identify patients who have amblyopia strabismus and get them into a treatment plan um, sooner rather than later. Uh, younger patients are, it is easier and uh, they're less likely to develop negative um, adaptations if they're treated earlier. So when should children be treated or, or at least examined to see if they have amblyopia? The first exam should be somewhere in between 6 to 12 months. Um, this could be um, um, done with the infancy program. What that is, it's, uh, the American Optometric Association um, has a number of doctors who participate in this program, including ourselves. We're basically um, we're doing a free exam for, for infants um, uh, that are 6 months to 12 months of age. And then we can screen for some of these problems like true business and amblyopia early and get uh, proper treatment um, if indicated. Uh, the next time to time period that they really should have an eye exam is somewhere between two and a half to three years old. That's the second most uh, common time to start seeing an eye turn. And then again, before entering kindergarten and then yearly while in school. Most cases of amblyopia develop somewhere between infancy and five years of age. So I thank you for your, your time. Um, if you would like to find out more, you can visit our website. Um, you could also email us or call us with your questions. 
Um, you might also want to check out uh, the COVD website, um, covd.org. Um, and uh, you can also check Google uh, Infant C to find a provider that um, provides the infant C exam if you have an infant that needs to be examined. So again, thank you for um, your time and have a good day.